You know what this electric oven needs? Fire. Before we get to the fire, I want to recap quick. Uh, when I last left you, I was throwing a piece of steel, looked kind of like this, into the uh, into the kiln there, seeing if I could heat blue it. Well, not like this. This is mill scale, more like this. You know, metal metal colored. Uh, my plan was to see if I could use it to heat blue something, if I could get the blue color. So I, I set it for a ramp of something that I forget, and to hold for like 20 minutes is quarter inch, is just mild steel. I ground the mill scale off. Anyways, that's what I did. I came up with bum, ba, da, ba, this. It's certainly a different color, but it's like, I was going for blue, and it's kind of that straw purple boundary. So that didn't work. I figured I, I I figured the temperature was right. I just maybe didn't have it, uh, it. It maybe heated up too quick, and then held for too little time, and the the metal just didn't have time to catch up because this is kind of big, and I only had it there for for a short period of time. So I took another piece, cleaned it up crappily, threw it in for a, a shorter period of time. Scratch that. Threw it in for a longer period of time, and had it had it heat up slower. You know, the ramp rate was slower, and I came up with. Ba -da -ba! There we go, kind of bluish and purplish, and I, I really didn't clean it very well. I can see, still see the grinder scrapes. There we go, heat blue. So we got the high temperature test done with the cone curling over. We got the lower temperature with the heat bluing. It works. What we don't have is a reduction atmosphere, and to explain what that is, I got a book here. This is a book on glazes, but it has this, these nice nifty charts. Now these are called firing schedules. So you can see they have different names and uh, it, they have different ramp rates. So like this heats up really quick and then just kind of cools down. You can see even the fastest schedule here after 24 hours is still at 200 degrees. So it takes a long time to fire something that hot. You have other things. See this is this heats up, holds briefly, and then it then it slow cools. So it runs the element to slow cool. Or like it can get really complicated where it holds at the top for a while, holds at the bottom for a while. And then like, like rapidly cools and holds, slow cools, holds, cools a little slower, and then free falls. So it can get really complicated. Uh, and all of this is really easy to program into that, that controller I have over there. But what I can't do right now is this on the next page. And this, the, the color here indicates the atmosphere. So yellow is oxidizing and uh, orange -er is reduction. And what reduction means is basically there's less oxygen in there. So the oxygen is, it's usually fire burns it up. Something, some fuel in there is, uh, is, is taking up all the oxygen, like, like propane. Propane is pretty common uh, in, in, a, in a furnace or in a kiln. Also, a lot of times they use like wood or something else to get other effects with ash, but I'm not worried about that right now. Propane, basically, they, they put in more air than propane. Now, when they reach a certain point here, this, this target, for example, is 1,780 degrees Fahrenheit, then they want... Uh, reduction atmosphere so there's basically like shut off the air or crank up the gas or something so that there's more gas eating up more of the atmosphere and then heats up and then when it gets to 2190 they they hold at 2190 Fahrenheit for a little while and it and it's even more heavy heavy reduction so there's very little probably no free oxygen at all in there and then they then they let it cool and this this kind of matters more it matters more in pottery I tried to figure out if there's a way to like you know, if like heat treating without oxygen in there might be useful, but really, like it seems like no one cares. Like it's it's not necessary. So so really, this is more of a pottery kind of thing, I suppose. And uh, there's a good example here where these two are the same thing, but one is fired in oxidation, one is fired with some reduction. Also, I couldn't find a good picture of this, but like like reduction versus oxidizing, as far as like glazes go, it matters. Like you, it can be the difference between like red and green, like stark differences, which is kind of neat. So as you can see, this this idea that I have, it's not my idea. I basically stole it from all these things, and uh, I'm not like shooting propane into a 500 degree box. You know, it's 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 gonna be like white hot when this, when this happens, and basically it'll be self-igniting. So I'm gonna make a tiny burner, tiny, tiny burner, and uh, and show you how I'm gonna set that up. I got this book here, very good book, also on pottery. But here he has uh, diagrams and stuff for converting electric kiln to gas, because he fires in reduction and uses an old electric kiln. And uh, he, he kind of baffles it, he shows the baffles, 
basically to make sure the air all circulates around. And I'm probably going to do that with shelves and stuff. But basically, you don't just want fire shooting in and hitting something sitting right there. You want it to have to circulate and get it nice and even before it goes out. And I'm not going to worry about that all too much, although I am probably going to set it up uh, somewhat like that, just with removable furniture. I'm not going to like stick it all together like this. And I can actually make the controller. The controller has another output that you can program to do whatever. They say like fans or whatever. Like you can have a fan turn on at a certain point to circulate air. I probably could make something so that it turns on the gas at a certain point and turns it off at another point in the firing. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this manually. And that's because anything involving gas and fire, you really need to be there, like standing there, staring at the thing, making sure it doesn't cause a problem. Now this is pretty normal for like firing a kiln, a pottery kiln, because anytime you see these professionals like this guy who's using propane gas and stuff, like he's watching it the whole time. And they, they like draw out a graph and they chart the temperature and make notes and everything. When I was melting, when I'm melting metal and doing metal casting, the whole time the furnace is running and heating up, I'm standing less than 15 feet away watching it and making sure. So if something changes, say the burner goes out or, or the fire backs into the burner, I rush over there and I grab it and I fix it right away. You know, you, you don't want to leave this crap unattended. So enough of that blathering. There's also a book, uh, something about making kilns or whatever. I don't have it to show you because I got it at the library and I returned it a while back. But there's, there's more of that. Go to your li local library. Something, something, PBS fundraiser, I don't know. Okay, and here's what I have very simplified to work on this. If this looks familiar, it's because this is off of the foundry furnace burner. I'll walk you through it really quick. It's, it's just really simple, basically. This I got off Amazon. It is, I believe, a turkey fryer regulator. It goes up to 30 pounds. So it's zero up to 30, and it's adjustable with this little thing. I believe this just tightens down on a spring in the regulator. This is different from like a grill regulator because a grill one is just kind of fixed at a couple PSI or whatever it is, but this can go up to 30. So that's why when I'm running this with the foundry burner, I, I have the thing like cranked to maximum. So it's just putting out 30 PSI. Uh, it's not, it's going to be a little less vital for this and I'll explain that in a minute, but basically it's what I have. I, I don't believe that you should hook up to a tank without a regulator of some sort. Uh, some people connect up to a tank and just kind of turn it on and they use like like one of these valves as a gas valve. Some people will throttle the flow through that. I, I think you should have the valve, but also you, you really need a regulator. This, uh, this adds more safety also because all these regulators generally have a flashback arrestor. So there's no, there's no air that's going to be in this line. It's all going to be propane. But if there's air in the line and the propane mixes with the air and starts a starts combusting in the line, you get flashback, right? And this is a flashback arrestor to stop that flame from going through into the tank. Again, there's no oxygen in the tank, but just in case, it's not a bad idea to have, have a, a regulator with a flashback arrestor on it. This, I believe, is a 3 8 uh, flare fitting on the end. That, this is on the end of the, on this. This comes with the, the regulator. That goes into an adapter that converts this flare to a 3 8 pipe thread. This is a gas valve. So that when they say gas, they mean like uh, like propane or natural gas or something, not oxygen. Propane, pretty standard. And this is just, you know, a 3 8 pipe, 3 8 cap, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. Whoa. I know you can get you can get these valves where instead of having the, the, the pipe thread on both and requiring the pipe thread to flare adapter, uh, you can just get like pipe thread on one, flare on the other. I think I just got this one because it's what they had at the hardware store at the time. And then I got the adapter. So you probably shouldn't do that. I, I'm explaining this like I'm showing you how to do it. Don't do this. It's, it's kind of a dumb idea. So to, don't do it. But I'm showing you how I'm doing it. So I have this little thing. This has all been attached with pipe thread stick. And uh, I'm going to attach this on the end and drill a hole in the end of this. So that's going to be my orifice. Now when I did this on the uh, foundry furnace thing, I didn't drill a hole in the cap. I had a hole inside of this shooting through and, and it was a I think a number 58 drill bit or something, which is like 40 something thousandths, 42 thousandths, 43 thousandths inch of a hole. And that jetted out at 30 PSI and sucked air in too. And that jet mixed the air in, kind of gets the 
the, the air fuel mixed up and then it burned in a flare farther downstream. That's not part of this. Basically, I'm just going to attach this, drill a hole here, a little bigger hole, and we're going to uh, not have it sucking air through a tube and mixing up. We're going to have a, a slightly larger hole running at a lower pressure, just kind of lazily trickling into the furnace. But to get the hole, I want the hole in the end of this to be pretty centered, and I want it to be straight through, because this, you might not be able to see, but this, this piece here is actually an iron casting, and it's pretty thick. It's got some thickness, so if I drill the hole perfectly straight through this, it'll be, uh, here, maybe you can see it better. It's, yeah, it's, it's an iron casting. You can see the sand, the, the sand, the marks of the sand casting. Uh, and then they then they threaded that that in there. So if I drill a hole through the end of that straight and dead center, the gas will come out of there in a jet straight. But I can't really do that by hand, so I'm going to use my drill press, my old Montgomery Ward drill press. It has served me well these last half a dozen times that I've actually used this thing. Oh no, not these drills. Now the the orifice I put in the uh, foundry furnace burner was 50, 50 something, a little over 40 thousandths, whoops. Well this is 1 16th, also known as a little over 60 thousandths, so 50 thousandths, 50% 50 bigger diameter, roughly, 50%. I believe that's roughly the, the diameter of the hole uh, drilled in the, uh, the forge burner, not, not the one I built. The one I built is a 50, number 57 or 58 bit, uh, the forge burner I got from Roy Adams. Let me just line it up here. All right. This is loud. Never mind. This doesn't work. Stupid safety equipment. I really need to just bypass that. Come on. Notice I didn't spray any uh, WD-40 on that because this is a new drill bit and I like to live dangerously. Uh, this is a pipe thread which means it's it's tapered, it's not like a straight thread. Flare fitting is a straight thread and the flare on the end seats with the the, the thing, I forget what it's called, but this, the threads are actually tapered so that as you tighten them up they actually like squeeze together. And we use this stuff, this is a pipe thread stick, I just got some at Ace, because there's some in my toolbox, but man this stuff's, this stuff's dry. This has been on the shelf for a while, it's got this yellowed kind of hard coating on it. There we go. Get to the white, the more slightly buttery stuff. There we go. This is the stuff that we've had the best luck. We use all different sorts of stuff to, we try it anyway, all different sorts of stuff to seal the threads. And this is always the most successful in, in our experience. And we test all of these. Uh, we've tried, we haven't really tried the soap method because the soap method kind of blows. We use a, uh, a couple of different electronic leak detectors. The one we're using right now is kind of a high dollar one, so I'm really careful not to lose the thing. And this pipe thread stuff, sometimes it develops a hard crust that you got to break off, or if you know oil gets it, you got to make sure you get the clean stuff out of the middle, out of the gooey, nougaty core. Uh, plaster it all on there and crank down tight, and it doesn't leak. The stuff in the, the squeeze tube, that, that gray stuff, I hate that stuff. It doesn't seem to work right. If it's on a really high pressure application, it doesn't work that great. Uh, the, uh, the tape, the tape's a joke, throw it out. This stuff works best. Pipe thread stick, I get it at Ace. And we test all of it high pressure with an electronic leak detector that costs way too much. But if you have any other uh, opinions, share them below. It's not, you know, it's not even that vital for me to put this put this on because this is to stop gas from leaking through there and there's going to be no pressure on that like at all because I drilled a freaking hole in the end and all of this stuff too like this this stuff's not going to be pressurized like static pressurized like I might sure I might have the valve closed and I open all this up and like open this up and get some gas flowing but then like right away I'm going to open this and it's just going to be flowing through so like none of this has to seal up against leaks. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna grab a vice grip and like crank the thing down just because. We what you really don't want is a leak in like a house like behind an oven because that pipe going into the oven is gonna be pressurized all the time. You know so if that's got a tiny leak, well it's gonna sit there leaking a tiny amount 
for a long time, 24 hours a day. That's a lot of gas. You don't want that. So that's why it's important to use like good leak detection methods. And we find that electronic leak detector finds things better than the, the soap and water crap. In this case, has zero bearing whatsoever on what I'm doing here because none of this will have to hold pressure. I mean, I'm probably going to be running this at like half a pound. Sure, we'll call that good enough. I don't, I'm not even going to get the meter out of the truck because if there's pressure in here, it's going to be shooting out that hole. Just, you know, force a habit. That's not even like correct doing of all the stuff. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm done. I'm done talking. Okay, you join me back in front of... The thing, I've had it turned on for a while. You can see in the, uh, the controller there, it's at 1830 degrees Fahrenheit and rising slowly. This is roughly the temperature that uh, a Korean potter, I didn't talk to him, but I talked to his apprentice, uh, he starts injecting propane into an electric kiln to get production. So we're gonna try that. I've got this hooked up now. I have it connected to a tank. I have the regulator cracked open just a little bit. My face is off screen. I will show you what happens when I turn it on. We get a nice, not, not, here, let me get more. There we go, a little more fire. We got a nice little candle. It looks kind of like the flame on the end of one of these. Not very much gas, right? So I can use the regulator to crank it up, crank it down, and uh, I've removed the little plug that I had here. Remember, this is one of the, the thermocouple holes. Drilled another little one here. When I'm not using this, which I assume I will not be using this pretty much all of the time. I don't think I'll ever use this, hardly ever. I'm just going to stuff a little bit of ceramic wool in there. And for those of you wondering about, like, this gasket, I don't think that's necessary. I'm just going to pitch it. I just haven't done it yet. So my idea is to uh, inject the gas into the lower hole, like so. The smoke is a sign that it is currently in reduction in there. So it's, it's severe reduction. So that's using up all of the oxygen in there, combusting it, and you're getting uh, soot and perhaps a bit of carbon monoxide out the top. And, um, and I'm going to uh, turn it off now. Um, when I'm using it, I might, I might end up making that hole a little bit bigger. I think uh, a little bit of more visible flame uh, if I allow a little more oxygen in, I, uh, I think I'll get less soot. The reason I'm getting so much soot, I believe, is because it is uh, it's too, too reducing in there. Too much reduction. It's so hot that any time any, air, any fuel goes in there, it's going to combust instantly. There's no chance for it not to combust when it's in there. It's not going to fill it up and explode. Uh, that being said, don't do this at home. I don't know what happened if I like just really bake the crap out of it, huh? See, even more, even more reduction. Okay, I'm going to turn this thing off now. And that's all the functions of this thing done, basically. I don't, I didn't have that burner set up on like a stand or anything like I'd like, but that's not the stand that I want the whole oven sitting on. So I guess that's not so vital at the moment. And you really don't need to see me just welding one stick onto a thing and then attaching a burner to it, because you've seen that before. But that, that that's it. That's, that's all the functions and pretty much done then with that, with, with the super oven. That took way too long to make that. And I'm still not done yet because i got to build another shell because that shell didn't fit. But I'm not going to put that in a video because I already built a shell. It was just the wrong size. So imagine that plus three inches more height. Uh, I might coat the inside of it in Satanite. I might not. It's probably not necessary. Now it's like I'm lost. What do I do? What do I do with my time? Oh right, one of the other 50 projects I never finished.